Hi gang. Today I want to talk about some very significant parts of international marketing. And so I think this presentation is going to run a little bit longer than the other ones you've uh, been viewing so far. So at certain points in this presentation, usually where you see the, the bullseye in the background like this, it uh, might be a good time to just pause and take a break, stretch your legs and uh, go get something to eat. Uh, but I uh, want to cover segmentation, uh, targeting, value propositions, and perceptual maps today. And several of these tools uh, should be incorporated into your global presentations. And so I wanted to give you some framework here. Um, an awful lot has been written and talked about for segmentation and targeting. So I'm going to assume many of you already have somewhat of a foundation here. All I'm going to try to do is give you some application for the principles of segmentation as it relates to uh, international marketing and then also talk about some of that for uh, uh, targeting as well. So let's start with the definition of market segmentation. I think we're all pretty familiar with this concept, but think in terms of aggregating prospective buyers together into groups, segments, or sometimes I'll call them buckets. And these buckets have common needs or wants or preferences. Uh, so so their, their product requirements are the same. Uh, many times. And number two, they have promotional requirements that are the same. That is that they would respond similarly to a type of marketing action, uh, whether it's an, an ad, an online uh, social media campaign, uh, a tweet, whatever it might be. In general, they have the same or similar product uh, requirements as well as promotional requirements. Uh, very quickly, I want to talk about the advantages and the benefits to segmentation because oftentimes some people wonder why we would spend so much time on segmentation. I think it's important for us to uh, just review the advantages and benefits. And so you'll see I'll give you an advantage and then I'll translate it into a benefit. So one advantage to segmentation is that it drives more efficient spending. Um, and I think that can appeal not only to marketers but to the finance folks who, who are watching this uh, or other departments as well. And the benefit to this is that you would then free up cash for uses in other areas or to even leverage further um, some of the types of activities you would pursue for this segment. Number two, ideally, if we're segmenting our target segments, we would also craft highly targeted messages to these segments so that they connect more deeply with them. And I think you would probably agree that there are some companies out there who you almost feel like they're speaking directly to you. They're uh, talking about some issues that are very relevant to you and they're providing significant value. As a result, uh, when, when you talk this way to your segments, now you can break through some of the competitive clutter that's out there because like I said, uh, people go, oh, I, they get me or they, they are talking the language that I understand. This also uh, segmentation can position your company as an expert so that you stand out from the crowd. Uh, back in the early days of Apple, they were very strong in the print, uh, print production and creative design element uh, of our economy. In fact, they still are. And part of the reason was that they offered a line of products and also support services that supported this segment so well that people felt uh, they, they, they had so much more to offer than any of the other competitive set. Number four, um, especially important in international marketing, segmentation can result in more concentrated distribution so that you can leverage these channels that you're in and perhaps be more exclusive in the channels you choose. As we're learning from our work with uh, looking at the global perspective and trying to understand aspects of uh, political, economic, social, technology uh, factors in each country, you can see that one that keeps coming back, especially in the emerging marketing countries, is that there is poor infrastructure. So concentrated distribution in those countries and those segments that enjoy better infrastructure makes the most sense in, in, in the international scope. 
We would think also that segmentation would create loyal customers because, again, we're talking their language. We have a, a, an affinity and a connection with them. So you as a company would enjoy faster repurchases and also multiple purchases, perhaps, so that they are purchasing things for friends, family members, uh, colleagues, peers, whatever it might be. And you're going to spread your word of mouth or these days, just as important, word of mouth faster. So the more you can craft your segmentation efforts and deliver through targeting, the more, hopefully, the, the more the, the uh, possibility is for your message to get forwarded either verbally or online. And lastly, I keep talking about brand equity, extremely important. You can add financial value to the bottom line and ultimately, in a defensive way, prevent brand dilution faster. And we talk about this in our brand equity and brand equity pyramid section. So I'm trying to reconnect back with those concepts that we talked about. I want to give you just some common methods. Again, I know many of you, this is, this is basic, and so you can skip through this pretty quickly. But think in terms of four basic methods for segmentation in an international marketplace. Uh, the first, very obviously, is demographic, and that by default we always seem to, to think about this, but think in terms of um, the, the factors you see up here, age, income, gender, and household size, but also internationally think about targeting in on ur highly urbanized areas and using some of the tier systems, tier one, tier two, tier three cities, uh, you can choose those more highly urbanized uh, environments to deliver to your segments and the, the, the thinking is you would have greater promotional infrastructure and you would have higher concentrations of these individuals there. Um, I thought it might be helpful to uh, hear from another source, in this case McDonald's, in their segmentation targeting positioning. So I'm going to play a quick video here that will talk about uh, McDonald's uh, work in segmentation targeting and positioning. Products relevant to a variety of consumers. Companies use target marketing. Marketers identify specific segments of the population and position their products to appeal specifically to that segment. At McDonald's, segmenting is central to their marketing strategy. But the burger giant takes a different approach to segmenting than most companies. Traditional consumer packaged goods companies, such as Frito-Lay, organize their marketing department by brand. And so you will have a brand manager on Doritos or a brand manager on Lay's, et cetera, et cetera. At McDonald's, instead of having a brand manager on Big Mac and a brand manager on French fries, what we have are segment managers. And so at McDonald's, you will find a director of young adults, a director of women, moms, a director of African-American consumers, a director of Hispanic consumers, etc. So that structure all by itself puts McDonald's in a position to really maximize targeting marketing efforts. In order to target markets accurately, McDonald's uses segment insights. Insights are information about consumer behavior that are developed through market research. We're constantly, every day, all week long, collecting information and data about the different segments that each of our marketing people are responsible, um, you know, are responsible for understanding. And what we pull from these segments are insights, pieces of information that help us understand how to describe our products in a way that will be most compelling for the particular segment. Consumer insights focus on the values, needs, and lifestyle of each segment. Using these insights, each segment team creates a positioning profile for every product. Then the creative team uses these profiles to produce ads targeted to relevant segments, as well as to the general population. In the case of our Southwest chicken salad, we learned from our consumer uh, intelligence that this salad presented such a cool variety of ingredients that the general market would find that compelling. So if you look at our ads that were targeted to the general market, you'll see the emphasis on the variety of fun things in the Southwest chicken salad. Hi, can I get a Southwest salad with crispy chicken? And I want that new thing with the grilled chicken and tortilla strips. You know, it has that real cream dressing. Oh, and I think some lettuce. On the other hand, if you look at the African-American consumer advertising, 
we learned from marketing intelligence that the African American consumer is less inclined to uh, consider a salad as a substitute for almost any of the sandwiches we have at McDonald's. And so uh, instead, we needed to develop our message in a way that said to this segment, this is a hearty, filling, interesting and exciting salad. If you look at our Hispanic consumer segment, the Southwest chicken salad is full of ingredients that, uh, that resonate with, with culture and heritage and are compelling ingredients to a Hispanic segment for a whole different reason. The Asian consumer's requirement includes variety of taste and tasting new and different things. And so what we presented in our advertising that was targeted to Chinese and Korean Americans was the whole notion of this variety of ingredients and a new exciting taste. Target marketing has proven to be very successful for McDonald's. By understanding the various consumer segments and positioning their products to appeal to each segment, McDonald's has been able to increase overall sales. At McDonald's, there are a couple hundred people who work full time just keeping the information current and keeping the information coming so that we can use insights to make certain our marketing is compelling and that our marketing efforts do in fact result in business building marketing. In order to make their products relevant to a variety of consumers, companies use target marketing. So a couple of things to talk about here. First off, uh, recognize the uh, importance of insights and consumer insight divisions in this particular uh, category. Uh, you can see how once segments are identified, the need for constant research and feedback from these segments drives part of this effort. Also, they talk about cultural or heritage aspects of segments and how important it is to focus on some of those aspects to appeal to those segments. Uh, we could talk about religion, we could talk about language as cultural aspects. Hofstede, now that we know more about that, we could try to, on the six dimensions, uh, identify some cultural uh, factors that are important that would help us with our targeting against these segments. Um, here are two examples, uh, or sorry, before I do that, let me show you uh, one framework for trying to capture what are all the, the uh, aspects of a country's culture. You can see this one here from 2001 tries to identify some we've already talked about, religion, etc. But it also talks about values and attitudes, the social organization of people in this culture. And um, so I want to capitalize or, or leverage or talk about a couple of these within the context of two examples here. So let's talk about Jimmy John's now. And I'm going to show you two commercials. The first one will be targeted to the Hispanic population. And as I set this up, I want you to ask yourselves right off the bat, what do you think are some of the most important cultural aspects they are trying to appeal to in this particular spot? So I think you would uh, you would agree that in this particular spot we see family being a very important aspect of Hispanic culture. Uh, there's music that very definitely triggers thinking back to this segment and perhaps others that you came up with. Now let's take a look at a Japanese commercial for Jimmy John's. Same product, different culture altogether. Ask yourself, what's different about this spot versus that spot that we just saw for Hispanics? Jimmy 
Who's your favorite sandwich delivery guys? So you can see that there is quite a distinction between these two spots here. In the Japanese spot, I pick up aspects of a more male-oriented culture or a more highly masculine culture. Uh, and um, I see a business application where the young executive is trying to impress his boss. I see authority in the boss figure. And I see finally the connection with the boss as a result of Jimmy John's being the solution. So two different approaches altogether for the same product or the same category, in this case, uh, um, quick service uh, restaurants like Jimmy John's delivered um, between two different cultures. A third way to think about segmentation is along behavioral lines. And I think in terms of uh, usage occasions, uh, or the, the, the rate of usage for a particular product, or sometimes there's a preference for shopping. And I'll talk about a real world example I came into here in a second. With respect to occasions, this is a particular type of champagne called Vuv Clicquot. Uh, and this bottle is actually is um, four bottles worth of champagne within this uh, uh, one bottle. It, all, it comes in a wood lacquered box and there are a significant number of attributes that make this a luxury item. Everything from um, the skin uh, that is on the neck of the bottle that comes from three different types of exotic skins, um, animal skins. Uh, in addition, it, uh, it, has, it, it comes in a block and the block allows it to stay chilled for two hours. So what's the, sh what's the usage occasion for this? Many times this is used in polo matches uh, where people are going to be spectating at a polo match and, uh, or any sort of an outdoor event. Uh, I picked polo matches specifically because our daughter worked for an events planning company in New York City and she actually was involved with the Vuv Clico uh, polo matches that were out on Governor's Island. And so very definitely there's a different demographic to this segment, but also where they go and what they do, their occasions for the use of products are quite a bit different as well. When I was marketing director at Select Comfort about 100 years ago, <laughs> Uh, we had uh, developed our own company-owned retail stores. This was before the days of internet. Uh, and we had a, uh, a, an in-house telemarketing department that we would field calls from, from over 100 publications we were placing ads in each month. So really we only had two distribution outlets or two channels. We had uh, company-owned retail stores or we had phone sales. Well, there's quite a, a large segment of the population that when it comes to a bed needs to try it out or, or lay down on it or, or have their partner come in and, and try it out. And so we realized uh, from a, a bunch of letters that we were getting that people would not order via phone alone, nor was there a retail store anywhere near them. And so I think of Billings, Montana as an example. At that time, there was no retail select comfort store there. So we hit upon this idea of what we call the road show. And the idea was fill up several trucks at the beginning of the summer with uh, beds, pillows, foundations, any product we had available for sale. Uh, and we would also hire a bunch of college people to drive these trucks around the country. And before the trucks pulled into Billings, Montana, we would strip off those names from our database and we would mail an invitation with an offer, free pillow if you show up, and people would now have the opportunity to go to the Holiday Inn where we would set up for a weekend what we called a Select Comfort Roadshow. So people actually now had the ability to try this, to lay down on it, to have their partner come and, and experience this product. And they would not have had that opportunity without these road shows if we continued along those two distribution channels. So just remember that there's a segment of the population out there that is strictly behavioral and we have to appeal to them as well. The last one is very obvious and that is uh, segmenting along pricing lines. Here's an ancient example uh, of the General Motors uh, portfolio of brands back in the 20s and they very clearly saw price tiering or price segmentation as a real opportunity to attract the right person to the right model within their portfolio of brands through this price segmentation. And I would challenge you, are, what are some thinkings right now, some contemporary examples of price segmentation going on out in the marketplace? 
So give that some thought. One last segmentation method is along the lines of benefits. And uh, what I typically do in a class is I'll ask, okay, how many varieties of crest, crest toothpaste can you name? And then we have a little brainstorming session and I'll put them up on the board. Well, it's no surprise to many of us who've grown up with the brand Crest that there are multiple uh, uh, product offerings available and they are targeted to the benefits provided to the consumer. So in this particular case, here's a whitening crest on the left and a tartar protection on the right. Then there's sensitivity pain. Um, I, I would be interested in this uh, for tooth uh, and, and, and uh, enamel. There is cavity prevention crest. There is gum disease crest. There is stain protection crest. In fact, if you click on this link, you can go out and you can see exactly how many varieties they offer. And at one point, it got a little out of control. I think they had over 50 or 60 separate uh, uh, SKUs that they were trying to deliver on all of these benefits. And pretty soon the retailers push, pushed back and said, we can't carry all these. We have limited space, so you guys have to choose. And so ultimately what ended up happening was Crest uh, began to reduce the number of offerings and focus only on those that, that had the largest segments for these benefits. So when you get to segment attractiveness, think in terms of questions you would have to ask. And uh, some of the more uh, uh, obvious ones are, what's the size of this segment? How quickly is it growing? Does it have good prospects for growth further on down the road? Um, how, what's the competitive set like? This tracks back to um, some of the work we've done previously in this course. Do we have the resources internally to market to this segment? So think in terms of the staffing functions you would need. Uh, in order to deliver on this. And then externally, how would we reach the segment we are targeting? And I would break this down into uh, reach in terms of uh, distribution and the, dis the physical distribution of the product, but also think in terms of how what, what kind of marketing infrastructure is available to us so that we can deliver messages to these particular segments so that they can thus purchase the product they want. Here is um, a laundry list of, uh, just a partial list of some of those properties that we might look for. I just want to highlight three others that I haven't talked about so far. Um, think about the quality of the telecommunication and transportation infrastructure. Think about the availability of partners for, or strategic alliance partners available to you as you're launching into a foreign country. And then think also about the service providers that you, the allied service providers you would need in order to help you market this brand. It could be market research firms, banking and finance firms, and all the others you see down there. Ultimately, it helps to have an attractiveness grid that looks something like this. Um, you can identify the potential market segments as I have across the, the columns. You can identify the decision criteria for each of the segments along the uh, row headings on the left. And then ideally you would weight each of these decision criteria. Uh, some would be more important than others. And then you come up with a score uh, and a weighted score ultimately for each of the segments showing the attractiveness of them. A good tool to use when you're doing uh, segmentation. Key takeaways on segmentation. Uh, I think the benefits of why we would segment are clear, certainly to a marketer like me, but hopefully to others uh, of you who are not marketers, you would see that the benefits are clear on segmentation and it's especially important in international marketing given the variance in culture and values and attitudes. Uh, also, there I've identified multiple methods for, for segmenting. Um, and I think the most important word of advice I can give is at some point you just have to prioritize them and then choose one or two and commit to that segmentation method that you're going to be using. And McDonald's showed us how, how they're doing that and, and the commitment they're making towards that. So this might be a good time to pause if you're getting a little tired or a little itchy. Um, I'm going to jump right into targeting, but I'll give you a, a, an opportunity to pause right here if you'd like. So targeting really is taking all of this work we've done with segmentation and now trying to apply our price, products, place, and promotion to these segments. 
And once we've identified the unique needs and the preferences, now we start targeting our messages and our uh, uh, promotional work as well as the pricing. We might choose particular channels to focus on this segment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some considerations that you might want to think about as you begin to target this segment that you've chosen or segments you've chosen. Number one, think about the intangibles in the culture, and these could be customs or values like we've talked about. Is there a mood that, that is more readily accepted among this segment versus others? And then think also about taboos. Books and, and uh, articles have been written about mistakes made on, on the point of marketers who have uh, chosen one icon or one word, which is completely inappropriate to the culture that they're targeting. Number two, think also about language. Um, first, uh, think in terms of literacy level. In some emerging countries, we have very low literacy levels. So now the challenge becomes, can we deliver a promotional effort that uh, encourages this segment to purchase, but doing it with a minimum amount of words? Also, we would want to uh, account for dialects, pronunciation, words, or phrasing. And the last one I would mention are what could be call, called visuals. Certain colors are particularly apt for cultures. Red in China comes to mind. Spokespeople, you already are well aware of people like Sam Elliott, the voice of the Chevy truck ads, who, who add a distinctive element to the targeting for a particular segment. Spokes characters, these would be more animated or non-living uh, characters that, that might be used against a particular um, segment. And then I want to talk about iconic imagery for a second. And the example I would, I would um, want to elevate is Bulgari, which is a, an Italian company focused primarily, a uh, luxury company, focused primarily in the jewelry, accessories, and clothing arenas. And what's interesting about Bulgari is if you look at their website, they are very, um, they, they identify icons that are important to their brand. And these icons run throughout the advertising as well as the product development. One of the first of them is something called a serpenti, which is a serpent. And uh, this in, in the, cult, the Italian culture or the ancient cultures was an emblem of wisdom, life, and eternity. And so you will see how Bulgari uses this serpenti icon throughout its product lines. And uh, there, here's some examples of jewelry. And then here's an example uh, of a, a, um, a handbag and the serpenti appears again in a, in a much more limited fashion. So think in terms of iconic imagery that's specific to that particular uh, organization. Last thing I would call out is if you look at Bulgari, the, the name itself, we're always confused by the V there. Well, the V is uh, a very important aspect to Roman culture because it's the classical alphabet character for the letter U. So that signals to those in the know, oh, this is a Roman, or sorry, a, an Italian brand um, that has a significant amount of heritage. So here's, here's one other example of a symbolic uh, icon being used. I'll finish on value proposition now and talk quickly about a perceptual map. In some of the videos we've looked at and some of the readings we've talked about, we hear a lot about positioning, which is very important in marketing. But I'm going to focus instead for this class on value proposition, which I think is a, a, an easier way to get to an element of positioning. And perceptual maps can help you with positioning against the, the competition. And so I'll cover those in this quick section as well. But let's start with value proposition. So a value prop is a marketing statement that's a promise of value uh, that will be delivered when someone purchases a product or a service or any kind of offering. Uh, ultimately, it's the primary reason that a prospect would buy from you. Um, and that's quite a bit different than positioning. Uh, I, would, I would lump value propositions underneath positioning because positioning covers a, a broader area. Um, in addition, uh, one way to think about this is to think in terms of a value prop statement including or explaining three things. How relevant is this product? How valuable is it? 
And that's the specific benefits that we are looking for when we purchase this product to improve our lives. And then what's the uniquely differentiating component of this offering? Why would they purchase from us versus anyone else in the competition? Back to Bulgari, the uh, Serpenti is is a an exclusive aspect of that particular brand. And so if people want to show that they are in the know or that uh, this brand is important to them, the Serpenti becomes a uniquely differentiating icon, as do other elements. Here's a template I use for developing a value proposition and one I, I would suggest you use for your presentations and, and, uh, and um, here it is. So for blank, the target market, blank the offering is the blank most important claim among all blanks, the competitive frame, because it most important support or what is the uniquely differentiating aspect of this particular brand or this product. So here's an example. Let's, uh, let's talk about Volvo. Now I want you to think this through along with me if you could. So Volvo, what would you expect to be the target market for Volvo? Their target market is for educated middle-aged drivers. What would you expect their offering to be? Volvo or Volvo passenger cars. What's the most important claim they would make? Is the safest. Now, in, in more contemporary times, they've moved a little bit off of this, but um, I think we would all agree that safe is a word that typically comes to mind when we talk about Volvo the brand. Here's the competitive frame. It's the safest among all passenger cars. And what's the most important differentiating aspect here, or, or why do we get to SAFE? We get to SAFE because they design and they test to the highest quality standards possible. So Volvo is, for educated middle-aged drivers, the safest among all passenger cars because we design and test to the highest standards. This is a pretty good value proposition statement and one that I think your internal folks could understand uh, as well as your external customers and, and buying public. So if you have time, let me throw this to you. What would be Legos, Legos's uh, uh, value proposition? So think about this for a second. Who's the target market? What's the most important claim, competitive frame, and most important support? We could go through this, but rather than take time on that, I want to call out one thing, and that is um, think in terms of value propositions for separate segments you are targeting. So Legos, I would imagine, has dual segments or maybe multiple segments they're targeting. One of them could be the users or the, uh, in this case, children who are using Legos to build um, um, intellectually creative things and, and enrich their lives that way. But parents are the ones who are purchasing this. And so moms, uh, more often than not moms, uh, would be one of the dual segments that would need to be addressed and you would have to develop a value proposition for that segment as well. Here's an Apple IIe print ad back from uh, late 70s. Um, and I only show this to you, well, for two reasons. I'm a context guy, so I love to look at historical examples of marketing because I think it helps us understand things in present day. But more importantly, I think it also is a good example of Apple trying to get to what their value proposition was back in the late 70s. And that was the popularity or the best-selling nature of this computer. Because they had the uh, all of these different features and uh, advantages the benefits were that you can trust yourself to make the right decision when you purchase an apple because so many other people have so that's a pretty strong value proposition if you're in a leadership position some other examples of value propositions uh, let me just show you two of them these are out on the internet uh, the first one is called stripe So as you look at this initial landing page for the site, you can see, or you can ask yourself, does this get to 
all of the aspects of a strong value proposition. And I think it does a pretty good job. You, we understand who the audiences are. We understand what they deliver. We understand perhaps what the superiority is or the most important um, claim that they can make. Here's another one for a different uh, organization called Geekdom. So this one, to me, is a little bit clearer because, again, I understand all the different audiences we're talking to, but I also get a better understanding of the benefits because you can build your business and there's other cool things that can happen. You can be helped by creative, so there's a social component. I mean, reading into this, this is a pretty good value proposition that gets to why we would seek uh, geekdom over anyone else who's offering a collaborative workspace. The last thing I want to end on is perceptual maps. And this is a component of, of positioning and I think an important one. And uh, I would urge you guys to consider including this in your presentations. What a perceptual map is, is a visual tool that displays the perceptions of the buying public around product dimensions. More often than not, it's two product dimensions, and you'll see an X and a Y axis here. In this particular instance, we're looking at quality, excuse me, high or low, and then we're looking at price, high or low. But sometimes you'll find multiple uh, product dimensions represented on a perceptual map. Ultimately, what this thing does is it helps communicate the position of our brand, a product or a service or whatever where it is we're looking at, in relationship to the competition on these two dimensions. And so this can be very helpful because, as you'll see in a second, it can help us make more informed marketing decisions. Here's a sample perceptual map of soft drinks. You can see what the first two dimensions are, strong caffeine, or uh, sorry, caffeine, strong or no, and then sugar, uh, strong or no. And the next one has to do with uh, quick service restaurants, different category altogether, perceptual map of QSRs in the US, and this is based on locations and menu choice. So as you look at this, ask yourself questions like, where are most of the competitors grouped? And then conversely, where are there some voids in the space? And what could be a potential opportunity for us if we chose to, to do that? Where, where's a space we could launch into where it's not dominated by other competitors on these two dimensions? We would use perceptual maps to um, assess an opportunity for a new brand. And that's why I add this into the mix here, because it may well have application to your local presentations. We could identify opportunities for competitive differentiation. It may be that we are in the cluster with all the other brands and we have to seek a new defining differentiation point. And it also can help you detect the competitive set for particular attributes or features of your product. So you can see that competitors lump in, in one area around caffeine and sugar. If we looked at another, uh, carbonation or availability of, of the product, we might have a different lumping together. So we can see who's our competitive set for particular types of um, uh, features. Lastly, I think we've kind of gone through this, but what questions would be asked when you're reviewing a, a, um, a perceptual map? Uh, the first one is, are consumer attitudes towards our brand matching what we want them to be? Two, do competitors seek consumers um, uh, closest to the brand or furthest away from the brand? And then, like I had mentioned previously, do holes in the map indicate an opportunity where we might be able to launch a new product or reposition, move our current brand out of that clump and move it somewhere else so that we have uh, greater um, clarity in the marketplace. Um, here's an exercise on creating a perceptual map. I've given you two different categories of attributes, left-hand column and right-hand column. This might be a way for you to try to understand better uh, through application how a perceptual map could be generated. In class, I typically will choose a couple of beer brands, and now we would separate. We would see the separation and the clumping of these brands. Uh, but you may want to do it in in uh, in another category altogether. 
And I like to provide tools to you guys uh, in case you decide to use these in your presentations. This is a free tool. By clicking on this link, you'll get a YouTube and also they give you directions on where to go in order to download the perceptual map Excel model. But uh, here is a way that you could create your own perceptual map if you wanted to. So just wrapping up on the key takeaways, value propositions will hone an identity. Remember, it's along two dimensions, uh, but still it can help you better understand what's the identity in the minds of our consumers and are we tracking with the identity we want to be crafting. Also, they can help you with positioning against the competitive set. Who are our competitors in this market space and what would we have to do in order to try to uh, break out of this clump? And then lastly, it's a visual tool, so it can be used in conjunction with other types of positioning analysis that you do. And some of us, myself included, are big visual learners, so um, this might be an opportunity to, to provide a tool that can help people get to your conclusion uh, faster. So in a nutshell, that is segmentation, targeting, value propositions, and perceptual maps. And I hope you enjoyed it.